Hey everyone, it's Dylan from Gamers Layer here. Today I am doing a Caster Chronicles deck profile on the Performing Arts, which is a talent-based deck. Uh, quickly, before I get into this, just wanted to go a little bit into deck construction for Caster Chronicles. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say it's very difficult uh, and express a lot of frustration in uh, the fact that they didn't know where they wanted to go with the deck. So I think the first thing I'd like to address about that is that you need to define a clear goal for what you want your deck to do and then build the deck based around that rather than picking uh, an archetype and starting. So for example, if I wanted to build a deck where I go wide and I want to uh, destroy lots of creatures and attack my opponent as quickly as possible, this is probably not the deck. I, I wouldn't make this deck. When I went out when I made this deck, I, I saw the strengths in it and I decided that this is a deck that has one creature really strong, which is something I really like to do a lot, uh, but also has the capability of uh, playing around that limitation and getting out lots of strong creatures that can protect you uh, and make sure that you're able to push when you need to. Uh, so that's what this deck does. Uh, there's a lot of creatures that are larger and they get the ability Vanity, which is if they're the only creature you control, uh, they gain additional ability, usually hubris, an attack and defense boost, and additional ability like making a guy sack, or destroying multiple creatures, or clearing out the grave. So anyway, uh, that's what this deck is designed to do. It's designed to have one creature, one really strong creature at a time, and get the most out of their abilities. And to do that, we have a cast of supporting ca uh, cast. Uh, we have a group of supporting casters that are built to make sure we get the most value out of our creatures as much as possible. So let's dig into it. I'll get started and, and explain some of the deck choices as we go. So first off, we got four copies of Spica. The first one is signed and in Japanese, so obviously you can't read it. But uh, you look at the top three cards of your deck by tapping, uh, add a talent from them into your hand, the rest go to the bottom. Kind of double-edged. You do really, really, really want the talent cards uh, because most of the talent archetype is based on having a lot of cards in your hand. Um, Spica helps that, and she also gets you specific ones, uh, like the casters you'll need for the rest of the deck. Uh, similar reason for running Riula. Uh, I will say, I think Riula is a little polarizing in that talent decks have probably the best draw engine in the game, uh, something that the other decks don't even come close to. Uh, and to that end, I'm <laughs> saying to run for Riula, even though this is not a pink deck, this deck doesn't use pink in any way, shape, or form, but Riula is just too good of a card. Uh, what it does is you show X amount of talents, you discard, draw that many cards, discard that many. So, although this doesn't straight give you cards, it fills your grave, uh, it lets you filter out cards you don't need, duplicate casters, all that kind of stuff. So, Realist, a four of. Uh, the main card you want in your hand is a Tina, because Tina lets you uh, put cards into play from your hand, talent, uh, with total cost equal to or less than the amount of casters. So, you have one caster, you get a level one. Level 2, level 3, level 4. Uh, this is really good because you could do this at instant speed. So if my opponent's doing an attack on me, for example, I could rest a Tina, put into play a 6 cost, one turn 6, 5 cost, turn 5. And the 5 and 6 costs have really good abilities and really good stats in this deck, even without Vanity. Uh, so Tina is definitely an auto-include. Uh, definitely need 4 copies of Tina. Uh, next we got everyone's favorite, Ari. Ari, however you pronounce it. Uh... This is basically a staple in most decks as a one or two of, but this deck you definitely need four because uh, it lets you use Tina's ability. Uh, you can uh, banish a servant and then use Tina to put a card from your deck or from your hand into play, and it could even be the same one you banished because you could use Ari to banish the servant, add the same copy back to your hand, and then use Tina to put it into play. Uh, you could also just pick up different cards in your grave and use those instead. It's really, really flexible. Um, along the same line, this one is specifically for the deck, but it works phenomenal. It actually works better than Ari in a lot of situations. It's Crane Chirp. So you banish the Servant, draw a card. If it's a Perform Arrest, you banish, you draw two cards instead. Phenomenal. Really great. It's a talent in your hand uh, for Riula and cards like that. Uh, it triggers Tina, and it allows you to get out your bosses that you want. Um, and that's the most efficient way to play them is through Tina, not through casting them for six or five, whatever their actual cost is. And that lets you be reactive. Uh, Rafina's in here as a two of. Uh, she's basically a staple in most decks, but specifically lets you reuse Tina, lets you reuse Crane Chirp, lets you reuse Ari, uh, just amazing uh, in general. <clears throat> uh, I have two Iori, uh, and this is kind of interesting because she lets you, you make Aether for 
any element if you're playing a talent. That's great in a lot of talent decks, but you only really play purple talents in this. Uh, so she actually doesn't gain an ability. The reason you play her is because she is a talent herself. So she'll work toward all of your abilities that require talents. Um, if you don't have her, you can substitute her for any other purple caster. But uh, generally, the talent tag is actually really important. Uh, so it might be kind of hard for you to get, being that it's a secret rare. Uh, which brings me up to our first creature, Incense Ceremony. Really important that it's a two cost. It's your cheapest creature. You won't get anything anywhere close to this. So opening with Incense Ceremony is ideal. Uh, so it's a 2k, 2k. And with Vanity, it gets another 1,000 in each stat as well. Uh, so just very strong. Uh, oh, and Hubris, which is also important. Very strong way to start the game. Uh, it's a good defender or a good attacker. Uh, we got three Proclamation of Life and Death. Uh, generally, this is your one of your few breaks, so one of your few ways of countering early game aggro. Uh, so you want to use that, make them um, get rid of a creature. Not super good when cast from hand, but Riula can filter it out. Uh, we got Traditional Martial Arts, another talent. Uh, so this one is one of the first ones that gain extra abilities based on the vanity. And this one is that whenever it attacks, it has a trigger. Uh, you reveal talent, so again, important to have those talents in your hand. Uh, and if you do, they have to banish a servant, your opponent. So really good. Uh, not great if you're attacking one creature, because they'll just banish the creature you're attacking. But it's good guaranteed removal while you're poking with Hubris. You can still clear creatures off your opponent's field. Uh, we got two summoning obstruction. I was running it at one, but I feel it's actually a very, very good and unexpected card because later in the game, you're able to play high cost creatures through the use of Tina. Your opponent is not, and because summoning obstruction actually returns it to the hand and doesn't destroy it, it actually allows you to get rid of big threats your opponent's trying to put down without triggering cards like Tina that they would have. Uh, so make sure that you are forcing them to pay for it again. Uh, a lot of times that even just tying up the man on a two or three cost can be the difference between you winning and losing. So canceling summons is extremely strong. Tea ceremony, uh, it's a four of. Most of the t uh, cards in the deck are four ups in terms of creatures. The biggest reason that tea ceremony is a four of is because, well, it's a break. We don't have a whole lot of those. It's really important that you have breaks so you don't get bodied by aggro. But also because it actually gets rid of creatures in the grave you reveal X amount of talents, and you get rid of that many from the game, your opponent's grave. Uh, that's amazing. It basically destroys the DCT mechanic. It's easily the best way to remove things from your opponent's grave uh, in the game. And you pick every card that gets removed. So absolutely amazing. It does see some play in some other decks as well. For Ferocious Mantis, uh... I'm going to be straight, it's just a break. <laughs> it uh, Removal almost never is a factor in this deck. If you draw it, you're probably just going to discard it for Eula. For Japanese Calligraphy, so this is your first really, really strong body that you'd want to play off of Tina. It's most times, 9 times out of 10, the one you want to play off of Tina, even when you're at the higher levels, uh, because it actually destroys a creature on enter. Uh, as when that doesn't actually require vanity by the way, that's just a regular enter ability, but the vanity effects also very good uh, Whenever you attack you're gonna reveal a talent your opponent banishes a servant so very similar to the three cost we just went over uh, But it's got 4,000 4,000 which is very very strong in terms of attack or defense uh, As well as having that enter ability so you play it off of Tina and just play uh, Blows up a guy also protects you from non hubris attackers very very good and and it gives you a body uh, to attack with on your own turn as well. Uh, finally, last card in the deck, besides the Energized Coin, of course. Uh, flower Arrangement, and this is a really good finisher because it's almost guaranteed to clear the board and hit them for game. Uh, so it gets a very beefy attack and defense boost, but that's not why we're playing the card. We're playing it because every talent you reveal, you will make them banish your creature. So this is, all, I can't think of a scenario where this doesn't clear their board of everything that it has uh, other than casting another creature with quick cast um, but it also has hubris and double corrupt as long as you have vanity uh, so it's a really good finisher because I can hit over basically anything they have uh, in the later game if you get that far you could even cast it for six attack and clear their board double corrupt and then if they have anything you can immediately sack it with an Ari or crane chirp uh, and then put it into play with Tina and finish them off for another two or just for attack, direct attack for game. Uh, so that's the basis of it. 
early game. I guess we can go through a bit of the deck now that we've gone through all the pieces. Spica is probably your best turn one because Spica allows you to filter for the combo pieces that you need. Uh, same thing with Riula, although she's not as good in the first few turns because her hand is a lot smaller. Uh, Tina is obviously what you're trying to get. So that's why she's at four copies. You don't want her stuck in your orbs. Uh, we already went over Ari, pretty generic staple. Crane Chirp is also pretty decent, but it doesn't actually see a lot of use until you start getting creatures on the board. Uh, but it is still a purple, and you obviously need those to play most of your creatures. Uh, Rafina just to trigger all the other casters a second time. Not really too much to say about that. Talent in hand. Early game is basically Incense Ceremony or traditional martial arts. Uh, again, you don't really play these. If you draw them, you just discard them. I cannot stress enough how good the cancels are when you get to the late game and they're very starved for mana. Aether. And Tea Ceremony is still an MVP. She's not very strong physically, unlike the other ones. She doesn't really gain very much from Vanity, but just really, really good in the matchups that you play her in. And beyond that, really just, just break and your finishers. Uh, so you can kind of see what I was saying about the deck being built uh, primarily to get out large, large bodies that do things on their own. Uh, again, since the vanity mechanics in play, you don't really want to swarm the board. But depending on matchups, if they're playing very aggressively, you might need to do that. It's more or less flexible in that regard. It's really just the uh, restriction of the first few turns only having uh, a two drop as your cheapest and a three drop. So when they're playing one drops and attacking you directly, you need to make sure you're hitting breaks or uh, defending appropriately. Uh, once you get to that turn five or turn six curb, that's your make or break point. You're either going to start winning the game or you're not going to be able to stabilize. Uh, so that's this one. Uh, I know there's a request to show the red deck off that we did in the uh, gameplay video we did earlier as well, so I'll do that. And I also have some other really cool decks uh, in gameplay videos I want to show you guys. Um, so feel like feel free to like and comment and subscribe if you haven't. I'm going to be making sure to do a lot more. Uh, please just let me know what you guys want to see in videos. I plan to do more for us of Will and Caster's content. Uh, I just really want to know what you guys want to see. Thanks.